There are others. First Peter chapter number three. Let's begin reading in verse number 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But if... But and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy or blessed are you. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. Verse number 19. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If, if in this life, if in this life only, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, if our hope in Christ is limited to this life only, only if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men and women boys and girls most miserable let's pray help us this morning lord come send your holy spirit may each and every listener on the internet and those that are watching via the live webcast May they sanctify this time by setting it apart. No text messages, no distractions, no folding of the laundry while watching the webcast. May they open the bread of life and feast from the Word of God without the distractions of pop-up windows. And then here in this auditorium, we set this time apart for the preaching of your word because your word is the instrument by which you have chosen to reveal truth to us. May the distractions that often engulf our mind be set aside and may the distractions that send us all over the place on our electronic devices during the preaching of the word, may they stop today. May we hear the truth in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So you may be seated. These are the three questions we seek to answer this morning. Question number one, what does it mean if I suffer for righteousness? Question number two, how do I sanctify my heart? Or how do I sanctify the Lord in my heart? Question number three, what is the answer for the hope that lies within us? Take your Bible, turn back to 1 Peter 3, for that's where we'll be focused on the preaching text. And we noticed in particular in verse number 15 that we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and we must be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us with meekness and in fear. So that's our focus this morning. We'll touch briefly on 13 and 14, but we want to run to verse 15. And not only do we want to deal with giving an answer, but I want to answer the answer. What I mean is, not only are we supposed to be ready to give an answer, but I want to answer what is the answer. In other words, I want to tell you what I think the answer is when he says there, each and every one of us must be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. What is that hope? 
In other words, two plus two equals what? I want to answer the what as well. And so let's get started. Peter's very fond of this word hope. In verse 3 of chapter 1, he reminds each and every one of us, if you've put your faith in Christ as your Redeemer, as your Savior, as the Lord God that He is, then you've been begotten again. You've been born again. There's been a second birth. Not a physical birth, but a spiritual birth. And that gives you hope. The reason it gives you hope is because you are in Christ. You're in Christ. In fact, in Christ you've already participated in a resurrection. It's a done deal from God's perspective. He sees you already in there. Verse 13, chapter 1. Hope to the end. Hold on to this hope. Persevere in this hope. Remain in this hope. There's grace to be had. And then verse 21. Who, referring to God, by God do you believe in, by him do you believe in God, that raised, God raised Christ up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Not the president, not the Congress, not the Senate, not your local government, all fine, all God ordained, sometimes emphasized way too much. Hope in God. Where's my hope? It's in God. So my focus is in God. My trust is in God. Not my money. I think that's a little bit why the Lord says that it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God because it's difficult for them to forsake their hope and trust and assurance in their money. Our hope needs to be in God. Now when we use the word hope, we don't mean it like this. We don't mean it like, sure, hope I get a good seat at the ball game. We don't mean it like, hope I get a good parking spot. That's not how we mean hope. Instead, we mean confident expectation. Not, not confident expectation. Confident, joyful expectation. In other words, I got something to look forward to uh, with great anticipation. This is going to bring joy to my life. Joy to my life on a congregation on a cloudy, dreary day kind of down. That's kind of how we feel when the weather's like this. I want to remind you that we've got hope in a joyful expectation. So verse 13, and then we'll get to the hope. Verse 13, kind of a general rule. He just lays it out. And who is he that will harm you? Who is that entity that will harm you? If as a general rule, you follow good. He's, he's not saying that there aren't exceptions. In verse 14, he throws out the exception, but he just encourages us as a whole. As a general rule, if you make the pursuit of doing what is good, you're probably not going to be persecuted a whole lot. Are there exceptions? Yes, sure. But let's face it, as John said this morning, most of us are not going to suffer a whole lot for the cause of Christ. That's just the reality. Down through the ages, have there been exceptions? Yes, and they have suffered for it. But Peter's saying, if you make your mission in life to follow what is good, you'll probably be fine yeah, as a general rule. And not a promise, but as a general rule. Kind of like this. If it is possible, as much as lies within you, work hard and live in at peace. I mean, be that great neighbor. Be a team player. You don't have to be contentious all the time. You can just live wonderfully in your neighborhood. Be that good neighbor. Live at peace. That's the idea. But Peter knows this. Peter knows this is coming. Peter heard the words of the Lord in Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you, much of which is false. Is that still happening today? Sure it is. You better believe it is. All you have to do is listen to the podcast that David did this week on Sermon Audio about Tony, right? Tony Dungy. He just made a little thing about, I'm not sure I would have drafted Michael Sam. And his Twitter account explodes with every explicit word in the world. And suddenly he needs to be executed, tarred and feathered, and taken out and left for dead. For what? For just a real kind of a, almost a simple thing. You know why? Because he was remotely challenging the normalcy 
of what isn't normal, you know, that he was challenging them and you're not supposed to do that. So this is happening. This is happening right here. And all you have to do is take a stand over here for the Bible. Just take a stand. Take a solid stand for the Word of God and just wait because it's probably going to happen. So if this happens and you are in fact suffering for righteous sake, not because you're a knucklehead, okay? Not because you're continually tardy, incompetent, or substantially lazy. No, if you're suffering for doing the right thing, not because you're difficult to work with, but you're truly taking a biblical stand and you suffer, here's the response. You're blessed. You're blessed. Now, now that's difficult for us to comprehend, isn't it? Especially the word happy. Oh, how happy am I? No, I don't think that's what it means. I'm not sure that's the perspective. I think it's the realization that I have been a partaker in the suffering of Christ. I believe it brings us closer to our Lord. I think it draws us to the reality of what our Lord did for us. Did they revile him, church? Of course they did. A little taste of what it might have been like. And then he reaches back to Isaiah, always going back. Why? Why does he keep going back to that Old Testament? Reaching back. Because he wants us to get the continuity. He wants us to realize this is the same God. This is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. This is not Old Testament for Judaism, New Testament for Christianity. No, these truths apply. So he says, and be not afraid of their terror. Maybe you're aware of these stories, maybe you're not, but when the, those the Christians in the past who have had to suffer for the faith, those that have went to the lion's den, those that have been martyred, those that have been burned, those that have been quartered, people always want to know, as you and I would, hey, what's it like? Are they experiencing pain? How bad is it? Imagine a scenario, if you will, that David had been found guilty of treason against the state. And we knew that tomorrow he was going to be burned at the stake. And the night before, we meet him in the prison and we want to pray with him. One of the questions we might ask you, David, is can you give us some kind of signal if God's grace is sufficient during the burning of your body? It might be blinking the eyes. It might be a finger. It might be a movement. Something prearranged. And then the martyrs of the faith oftentimes would be given sufficient grace through the miracle of God to endure the suffering and would communicate something. And then those around would be so encouraged to know that God's grace is sufficient even in death. Even in death. And so this is why, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of their terror. God's in control. Jesus said it like this, fear not them that which have to kill the body, but instead fear those that are able to kill the soul. All right, verse 15, getting to our key verse. Two real significant admonishments in this verse, kind of divided in half with the conjunction. The first one is, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. See it there? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. This is an instruction from the Apostle Peter to us. We are to set aside the Lord God in our hearts. So first let's talk about our hearts. The heart is the origin of human behavior, and from it flows everything we do. This physical heart pumps blood to every part of my body. I'm talking about the physical heart. The heart is the center of who you are. The heart is what regulates whether you're in a bad mood or rejoicing. The heart is is, is what determines the way you respond. Do I respond in kindness? Do I respond in bitterness? Do Do I issue out animosity or am I thankful. The heart. Uh, John Calvin called the heart the place where idols are produced. Uh, Jesus said it like this, for from within, out of the heart of men proceeds, notice, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. 
So if the heart is where all this stuff is coming from, I better get the heart in check. I need to get a hold of this thing. If that's where this is coming from, let me sanctify my heart. Let me get my heart under control. Like this, Proverbs 4, 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Guard your heart. This thing called the heart. I keep pointing here, but you know I'm not talking about the physical heart. I'm talking about that part, the center of who you are. That which determines when you wake up in the morning, are you just foul? It's coming from your heart. The manner in which you respond to your spouse. Do you respond in kindness or do you respond with the equal quippiness? You know, you can say that. I got one for you too. You know how that goes. It's coming from here. So the admonishment here in the proverb is keep your heart. Guard your heart. Get a hold of your heart. I need to, I need to keep this thing in check. How do I do that? Let's talk about that for a moment. That which goes into my heart often comes from here. What I view, what I see. So I'm going to guard it. I'm not going to let anything in here. I'm not letting anything in here. What about here? What I hear? I got to control this thing. How am I going to guard my heart if everything is going in without any regulation? Unfiltered. Just whatever comes in, comes out. How am I going to, how am I going to guard it? You understand this idea? Guard your house. Anybody come in and out of the house, in your house, I will? You just let them in and out as many as you want? Or do you kind of control it? You control it, don't you? Why? It's your house. It's mine. I got to keep it. You got to guard it with all diligence. That's your heart. That's the idea here. You got to control this thing. That's the admonishment. Next slide, Art. So set Christ apart as Lord in your heart. What in the world does that mean? How in the world do I set Christ apart as Lord in my heart? Isn't this kind of this constant process of filtering? Isn't this this regular thing of would God approve of this? Are these the words I should say? Is this the thought I should have? Is this the direction I should go? Isn't this a constant process in my heart of examining each and everything I think and say and do and determining, is this God glorifying? Is this, would Christ approve of this? Because when something is Lord, they're in charge. So if he's the Lord of your heart, then he's the boss of your heart. And is Christ holy? So that which is holy is what he would approve of. So I need to get a hold of this. And I need to think, is Christ pleased with the way I am talking to my wife right now? Now we're getting real practical. We're, we're beyond theory, and we're getting into everyday living. You know, in the master bedroom. The difficult part of living. We're home. Church clothes are off. We're, we're back to normal. We put away our smiles for church. And now we're back living at home together. And I need to sanctify Christ as Lord in my heart. So is Christ pleased with the way I'm treating my spouse right now? That's the idea. If God is my Lord, then wickedness will be put in check. Next slide, Art. If Christ is ruling as Lord in my heart, if God is the master of my heart, then that which proceeds from my heart will glorify God who is holy. Now, we all know in this room, each and every one of us, that unfortunately, we married sinners. I don't know how it worked. We got the bad end. I was looking for a non-sinner, and I got stuck with a sinner in my marriage. I was looking for that one, and here I am stuck. My husband is a sinner. And why, why, Kathy? Why was that mm, uh, unbelievable? Bob's a good guy. What do I do then? I was out. 
I was working hard at keeping my heart in check. It's out. It's gone. What do I do? How do I fix it? Do I ever confess it? Do I ever repent of it? Do I ever look at my wife and say, I'm sorry? Do I ever go to my God in heaven and say, I know what I just did, did not glorify you. Please forgive me. Because remember, I'm working hard at keeping my heart at all diligence, right? Moment by moment, minute by minute, Hour by hour, day by day, I'm working hard at sanctifying the Lord God in my heart. But I can't do it perfectly. Sometimes things come out. Sometimes thoughts occur. What do I do then? I confess it. I repent of it. I get a hold of it. Let's change the scenario. Young people, old people, everyone in between, anyone who's on the internet. Let's face it, folks. Google is a cesspool. Is it a wonderful resource? Sure. Can it also lead me all over the place where I don't need to go? Listen to me. You can be searching for pictures of Elijah. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm doing a study on Elijah. I want to have a picture on Elijah, Bill. And suddenly I find myself, when the images pop up, there's a lady laying on a windshield of a car prone. And I didn't search for a lady laying on a windshield. I searched for Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> what do I do at that moment? I'm starting to sanctify the Lord God of my heart. I'm trying to guard my heart. I'm trying to keep it with all diligence. How fast can I move the cursor up to X and click it? How fast? Do I mess around? Do I magnify it? Or do I sanctify the Lord God in my heart, which means I immediately get control of this? That's the difference. I'm trying to be real practical this morning. It's easy to talk about sanctifying the Lord God in your heart. That's wonderful. Okay, you talk to me. How do I do it physically, practically, each and every day, each and every moment? I gave you two examples. I walk up to my spouse and say, Sweetheart, the way I treated you stunk. Please forgive me. Next slide, Art. And then, our focus this morning. Let's see, where are we at? 22 minutes. Whew. 22 minutes. Be ready to give an answer. Let's look at this word answer in the Greek. If you have your Bible there and you have a pen, write this word next to it so you can see it. It's apologia. It's the word we get apologetics from. See the word answer right there? Your Bible may have answer or your Bible may have defense. And be ready always to give an answer, to give a defense, to give an explanation, to give a discourse, to communicate with words um, um, the, this hope that is inside you. Peter is assuming that he's writing to born-again believers who possess a hope that the unsaved world does not possess. And so he has this expectation that they're going to be able to open their mouths and communicate why they hope, why they have a hope. Apologetics is now, presently, a branch of theology devoted to the defense and divine origin and authority of Christianity. Apologetics is not what my, Peter had in mind, modern apologetics. This is not, you don't have to be a theologian to do this. Amen. This is not what he's talking about. Now, don't misunderstand me. I love apologetics. I enjoy apologetics. I think it has a place in Christianity. But I don't want anyone to think this morning that in order to do what he's talking about here, you have to be a theologian. Okay, just, just want to provide some clarity there. Don't anyone walk away saying, Pastor Sean was bashing apologetics. I'm not doing that. But I am wanting to make sure that you understand where Peter is focused right now. Peter's talking to moms who haven't been to seminary, who haven't taken a single apologetics class. But for 25 years, they've lived with a hope. They have read their Bible and are more than ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within them. We're not talking about unpacking the cosmological argument today. We're not talking about proving the historicity of Jesus. All good things. 
Don't misunderstand me. We're not talking about arguing for the legitimacy of the resurrection or explaining the intelligent design theory. No, this is much more personal. This is, I know that your son is dying of brain cancer and you seem to be okay with it. I don't understand why you're not falling apart. And she says, can I tell you about the hope that lies inside me over a cup of coffee? See the difference? See the difference here? I'm, I'm trying to encourage you this morning to realize that each and every one of you have been called to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. So you don't have to be a theologian this morning. You don't have to be an apologist. You, you can just simply know the hope and open your mouth. Why do you have hope? I'm going to give you four reasons over the next 19 minutes. I hope you'll write some of these down at least. One, I have a hope in the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible. Not Allah, not an intelligent designer, not the first cause or the uncaused cause. No, my hope is in the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of David, the Father of my Savior, that God. Why? Because that God has particular attributes and, 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 and is a particular way that gives me exceptional hope. Not just any God. Number two, my Savior. I know I'm a sinner. I know my sins are a problem. I know the power of the gospel. I want to tell you about that. Number three, this thing called the Holy Spirit. Amen. This amazing thing called the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to understand this, but I have the Spirit of God dwelling inside me. It is strange. It is unique. It is special. This Spirit dwelling inside me guides me, directs me, fills me with thoughts I otherwise wouldn't have, illuminates the Word of God, convicts me of sin. This Holy Spirit is amazing. Number four, I am convinced that life doesn't stop in the pine box. There's something to look forward to. Four things. That's what we want to unpack. Please take some notes. So one, the existence of the God of the Bible. Psalm 38, verse 15. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. In thee. In thee do I hope. Why? Because thou wilt hear. Now think about this. Adam, think with me for just a moment together of any idol that you've ever seen that doesn't have ears and eyes. Always constructed. Buddha, ears and eyes. Always constructed with ears and eyes. Why? Because we as human beings want to know that there's an entity that sees what's going on and can hear us when we cry out to that entity. Now think about that. We know that life often stinks. It is difficult. It is miserable. So each and every culture has created for itself idols that can hear and see. Look what the psalmist says. What gives the psalmist hope? The fact that God hears that God hears, that God can hear. When no one else is interested, Chris, and life is falling apart, and, and I don't have any friends, I need to know that there's someone who is listening to me. How many lonely people are there out there? How many people, how many people out there have no friends? Now this is very difficult for us to relate to. Any of you that are part of the Brian family, you have more friends than you know what to do with in most regards. There may be an exception sitting here this morning. And if you're lonely and you're the exception, I want to encourage you to come back tonight and become part of this giant family. Now, having set that aside, David, there's an amazing amount of people in Fayetteville that have no friends now think about living with no friends. Where do you get hope from? Who do you cry out to? Each and every one of us have the ability to cry out to God. God. 
and know that he hears our prayers. So when you're miserable, when you're desperate, when you're on the edge of suicide, when life is up against the wall, when the bill collectors are wearing you out, when suicide seems like the only possible answer, you have a God to turn to and he will hear and answer your prayers. Psalm 46. That's what we read this morning. That's what Joey read to us. Look at some of the lines in this psalm. Happy is he that hath God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord as God. This maker of heaven and earth and sea and all that is therein turns, which keeps truth forever. Look what he does here. He executes judgment for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. He looses the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. He raises them that are bowed down. He, he loves the righteous. He preserves the stranger. He relieves the fatherless and the widows. So, to sum up, this is the God of the Bible. This is why the God of the Bible gives me help. Because of the God of the Bible is involved in the affairs of man. Because of the God of the Bible is loving, kind, compassionate, merciful, gracious. Because the God of the Bible is just, honest, and upright. Because the God of the Bible is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. All. Now just think about those three single things that I just gave you. Who in the world would pray to a God that's not omnipotent? Sorry, that's too hard for me. Or a God who doesn't know everything. I'd love to get involved and just don't know how to fix it. Or a God who isn't omnipresent. Sorry, I'll be there next week. No, the God of the Bible has all the attributes necessary to intervene in your life and help. Or how about this one? Responsive to the prayers of His people. Were you here last week? Did we not last Sunday look at the way God is amazingly responsive to the prayers of His people? Or how about the last one? Working toward a predetermined end. Have you ever been in, in, involved in an organization, I don't care, scouts or any, any kind of organization, and it's so chaotic? You're like, is there a plan? Is anybody in charge? Do we know where we're going? Have you ever been in that kind of a chaotic situation? Have you had an incompetent leader? And you're like, this is miserable. The God of the Bible says, I'm in charge. I've got a plan. There's an end. Get on board. All right, let's move on. Someone says, I don't believe in the Bible, God of the Bible. Okay, you can go to intelligent design. You can. You can talk about the eyes. That's wonderful. But in the end, may I remind you, it still takes faith to believe in the God of the Bible. Bottom line. You, you can provide a great argument, David, towards an intelligent designer. But the God of the Bible, you have to believe by faith. Isn't it amazing that our Bible doesn't present any logical explanation for the existence of God? It doesn't. It doesn't say, let me tell you how he came to be. It doesn't even address that. It doesn't say, now, could you want to know where'd God come from? Right? It just says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. In fact, the presumption is you're a fool if you don't believe this. The fool has said in his heart there's no God. It doesn't even attempt to, to deal with it. It doesn't say, well, I understand. You probably don't believe in God. Let me explain five reasons why. No. It's just in the beginning, God. You can go over here to the uncaused cause or the first cause. That's wonderful. You know what that is? That's the idea that everything has a cause. All right. Here's the reasonable retort that the atheist says. What caused God? I don't have an answer, Bill. I don't have an answer for what caused God. I mean, I believe that God caused in the beginning, but I don't have an answer for what caused God. But they don't have an answer for what caused the spark that caused the Big Bang. Both sides are still looking for a cause for the cause for the cause. Once again, faith. All right, let's move to number two, Christ. Christ, the hope of glory. Christ who was sent by God the Father. Christ who was sinless so he could become sin for us. Christ, who's fully God and fully man. Would you think about this with me for a moment? 
Think for a moment, is there any other major religion on the planet or sub-religion that could say God became flesh and dwelt among you and understands what you're going through? Anyone? Did Allah do that? Buddha hung out? Hindu have anything? The answer is no, more, and some more no. Christianity says, I'll give you some hope. You have a God who understands what you're going through. You being rejected? He was rejected. Feeling lonely? He felt lonely. Despised? Been there, done that. What do you want? Tempted? Was there 40 days in the wilderness? No food, no water, yet without sin? It doesn't understand what I'm going through. I'm married to the most miserable man on the planet. You ever dealt with Sadducees and Pharisees that are trying to kill you? I believe there might be a parallel. What's your point? You go to him and you pray and he understands what you're struggling with. You know what that does for you? It gives you hope, Mark. Next slide, please. No, go back, please. I, I went through that too fast. Crucified for our sins, resurrected for, to justify all who believe. And how about the second from the last? Interceding. Interceding, advocating. God's right hand, Christ. That's Adam down there. Steve Dezama, Mike Hill, knows you by name. Advocating for you, Gene, on God's right hand, interceding for you. Robin, you don't have to go through Mary. Don't have to go to a priest. You can go to Christ who is interceding for you. And then how about the last one? Would you like some help? He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. You know, the president wrote a book about hope, but I'll just tell you right now, I've lost hope in the White House. Lost hope. My hope has got to be in something more than a four-year term. It's got to be in something more. Are you bashing the president? All presidents, doesn't matter who they are. Don't put your hope in George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or whoever your favorite president is. Put it in Christ. Number three, let's go on, let's go on. We're running out of time, just running, running out of time. It's killing us. Number three, my hope's in the Holy Spirit. What do you mean your hope's in the Holy Spirit? All right. Holy Spirit, indwelling Holy Spirit. You know that comforter that was sent? Those, those th that thing that the Pentecostals are all in love with and the Baptists are afraid of? That Holy Spirit that indwells you? Could that Holy Spirit provide you some hope? I'm going to try to do that for you this morning. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to think about that, that very idea. Because people without hope commit suicide. I think that's fair to say. I think that when you've lost all hope, you kill yourself. And we know in our community there's an epidemic on Fort Bragg. So it might be important that each one of us that are soldiers or work with soldiers or know soldiers are ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Because it could be that somebody is without hope. Now listen to what Paul says. You need some more hope. You, you need to invigorate your hope. You need your hope to be empowered. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the agent that makes that possible. Th think about it like this, please. Think about hope and an accelerator in a car. Let me go up here so I can illustrate it a little bit better. 
I want you to think about the gas pedal in your car as being the Holy Spirit. And you need some more hope. I need some more Holy Spirit. I need some more hope. I need some more Holy Spirit. I need, I need V8 hope. Vroom! I need some real hope. Let's get in love with the Holy Spirit. Amen. What do you mean get in love with the Holy Spirit? Let's remember that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Let's remember that God sent His Holy Spirit to indwell us. Let's remember that the means whereby He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, is by sealing you with the Holy Spirit. I feel no hope. But I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Holy Spirit of the living God, help me to have hope in hope. Look, I'm not stupid. I understand that we have a lot of hurting people in this church. We have folks that are stuck in marriages that are just, quite frankly, miserable. I'm sorry. We have people that are battling with cancer. We have people that are battling with wayward children. We have finances that are upside down. We need some hope sometimes. And I want to let you know that the Holy Spirit is the means whereby God gives us hope. Instead of shunning the Holy Spirit, let's remind ourselves that God sent the Holy Spirit. That God sent the Holy Spirit. I'm leaving. I'm going back. I'm going to give you another helper. I'm going to give you an advocate. I'm going to give you a comforter. How many of you could say, without raising your hand, I don't need you to raise your hand, but I want you to think about this right now. Forget about what time it is, please. And just think for a moment. Have you ever had a clear time in your life when the thought wasn't yours, the words weren't yours, and you knew for sure it was the Spirit that led you. Amen. You know what that is? That is proof positive that God indwells you. Right. Thank you, sister. Amen. That should give you an amazing amount of hope. Yes. Amen. Hope. Yes. Folks, sometimes it feels like the world is collapsing around us. $17 trillion in debt. No real significant change in the economy in several years. I need hope in something more. Next slide. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit is the power to hope. The Holy Spirit provides comfort and help in my time of need. The Holy Spirit guides me in all truth. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Word of God. The Holy Spirit seals me and provides proof positive that I'm His. The Holy Spirit convicts me of sin, which gives me hope. Hello? The convicting power of the Holy Spirit in sin gives me hope. How? Well, the natural man doesn't get convicted of sin. The natural man um, um, compromises and justifies and figures out every other way why he isn't a sinner. Have you ever over here on this side, talking to y'all in particular, have you ever had a scenario where no one knew that you sinned and yet you were still convicted to the point you had to deal with it? It wasn't that your mom and dad caught you. It wasn't that the policeman pulled you over. It wasn't that your boss saw you. You just knew. You knew that you had to deal with it and you could not ignore it. That should give you hope. And that's it. That's the idea. All right, one more and I'll try to be really fast. Because I have to get to this one. A future. A future. Can I say to every single mom, every single wife that's in a bad marriage, you have hope in an eternity with Jesus. In eternity. 
This is an amazing amount of hope. John chapter 14. I'm leaving. Not only am I sending you the Holy Spirit, but I promise you I'm coming back. And where I'm going to be, I'm taking you with me. Going temporarily, going away for a little while. And during that in-between time, you've got the Holy Spirit. Enjoy it. Be sealed with it. Relive, live in it. And know that you've got this promise from me. I'm coming back for you. I'm coming back for you. If we don't have any hope in a future, I want to ask this real simple question. What's the point? I just want to know what's the point. Get up every day, work really hard, earn money, save it, go to bed, do it again, do it for a week, do it for a month, do it for a decade, and then die and rot in a pine box. That's it? That's all the thing is about? It's just one colossal mess? No God? No hope? I'm done. Let me throw in the towel now. What is the point? Leave church, save your money, eat, be merry. But instead, he says, no, you know that there's an eternity. In fact, it's set in your heart. You know. And so the promise of a much better future provides an amazing amount of hope. Most of you do not know Ruth Holder. She's in her 70s now. I met her 26 years ago when she was teaching second grade here in Brian Baptist Academy. Ruth Holder is one of those ladies that you can't help but to love. Always kind. I mean, always. Like, are you ever not kind? I mean, you're always positive and always gracious and always, I mean, don't those people just make you sick? It's like, how do you do this? That's Ruth Holder. 26 years later, she's now laying in bed and she sleeps nearly all the day away. And it's only a matter of days until we say goodbye. If, in fact, there was no hope to see Ruth Holder in eternity, I would be, of all men, most miserable. Most miserable. For 26 years, I've fallen in love with this lady who's old enough to be my grandmother and has been an amazing example in many regards to Pam and I. I, I need to let you know that our hope is in something better tomorrow. Something better. Something more. A promise of life to come. A promise of eternal life to all who will believe. A promise of a better future for those who live for God. A promise of a coming kingdom where Christ is Lord of all. A promise of the ultimate and complete rule of God. A promise of the complete eradication of death. Sorry, sister. The complete elimination of sin. The complete and total and permanent and everlasting binding of Satan. All demons and the head and all sin and flesh and lust and everything that's associated with that is utterly and completely eliminated. Now, be encouraged this morning. Hope and hope. Be encouraged. God has a plan. God has a plan. There is something to have hope for. Four things. God the Father of the Bible. Christ your Savior. Is he yours? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And life everlasting. Let's pray. Father, not only do we want to be able to share the gospel, and we do, and we understand that there is a 
direct relationship between the gospel and the hope that we have here. But we want to be able to explain that why we have hope, even, even, even in our state of, of difficulty, even in our, our, our broken marriage, our, our premature son dying, uh, um, our, our finances in shambles, our, our son dying of a brain tumor, our wayward children. Oh, Lord God Almighty, we love you. Would you give us the strength to give an answer? Can I pray for you right now as your shepherd? Would you say, Pastor Sean, I could use some particular prayer about hope? Is there anyone in particular that would say, that's me, Pastor, I could use some hope and hope? Anyone at all? Yes, over here. Yes, right here. Anybody else? Anyone else? Hope and hope. Thank you. All the way in the back. Anyone else? Yes, over here. Anyone else? Is Christ your Savior? Is Christ your Savior? Do you have a hope in Christ? Put it there. Bill, go to the pulpit and pray for these whose hands have raised.